Hello everyone, welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. Today marks the 150 year anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. On the program that we've prepared today, we've put together a nice video feature about the battle at Gettysburg and also the address by Lincoln four months later. And we'll also dig into the archives today and show you a clip from uh, the Key of David program, one that was taped at Gettysburg back in 1999. So don't go away. The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. In early 1861, the future of the young republic of the United States of America looked bleak. By early March, seven states had seceded from the Union, and rebel forces had seized control of federal agencies and military outposts in the South, which provided the South with enough arms and supplies to amass a formidable foe. The South had also gained control of much of the Mississippi River, the nation's main lifeline for trade and commerce. Jefferson Davis had taken his oath as president of the so-called Confederate States of America, while the U.S. president, James Buchanan, declared himself to be the last president of the United States. It was into this thunderous storm that President-elect Abraham Lincoln sailed when he stepped into office March 4, 1861. Though in the eyes of many he was completely unqualified, the task of saving the Union had fallen squarely upon the shoulders of Abraham Lincoln. Before leaving Springfield for Washington, D.C. in February of 1861, President-elect Lincoln made a few impromptu remarks to about a thousand well-wishers who had gathered to see him off. I now leave not knowing when or whether ever I may return with a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. Without the assistance of that divine being who ever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail. Two years later, in May of 1863, Confederate General Robert E. Lee's army had gained ground in Chancellorsville, Virginia, and Lee was planning his second invasion into the north in June, Confederate soldiers successfully crossed the Potomac River in Virginia. Lee was aiming for another victory in the North. On July 1, 1863, Lee's soldiers clashed with the Union Army of the Potomac in a town called Gettysburg. It was the beginning of a brutal three-day battle in the small Pennsylvanian town. As recounted by the Gettysburg Foundation, on July 3, 1863, Confederate troops attacked the center of the Union line on Cemetery Ridge. After a cannonade raged for about two hours, General Robert E. Lee ordered his Confederate infantry to attack. More than 14,000 Confederate troops advanced across the field towards Cemetery Ridge. A deluge of artillery shot and shell raked their lines. Those who moved on toward the ridge advanced under a hail of fire. Of those who made it to the Union line, many fell or were captured in the fighting at the angle near the copse of trees. The attack that became known to history as Pickett's Charge concluded with a Confederate defeat and also ended the Battle of Gettysburg. Over 50,000 soldiers from both sides were killed, wounded, or went missing during those three days. To this day, it's the largest battle ever fought in North America. The ravaged small town of Gettysburg would take years to recover. Later recognized as the turning point of the war, the battle proved to yield losses from which the South could not recover. Less than two years later, General Lee surrendered and the Civil War was over. After the battle, a commission at Gettysburg planned a dedication ceremony for the cemetery 
for those slain in the historic battle. Edward Everett, the most famous orator of the day, was invited to deliver the keynote address. President Lincoln was also invited a month before the ceremony, more as a formality. After he indicated he would come, the commission belatedly invited him to give the concluding remarks. Lincoln had plenty of justifiable, honorable reasons to beg off from the ceremony, writes columnist Selena Zito. His 10-year-old son, Tad, lay sick with a fever in the White House. The war was going poorly out west. He was locked in a budget showdown with Congress. And his re-election bid looked grim against the general he fired for incompetence a year earlier. But Lincoln determined to go. He immediately wrote Everett and asked for a copy of his speech. He thought about his own remarks for days. The Sunday before it was delivered, he told someone, it is not exactly written. It is not finished anyway. I have written it over two or three times, and I shall have to give it another lick before I'm satisfied. Lincoln arrived in Gettysburg the night before the ceremony and spent the latter part of that evening going over the speech. The next morning, over breakfast, he was seen reviewing his notes. Even during the procession to the ceremony, while in the carriage, he was busy preparing for his few remarks. Abraham Lincoln was in Gettysburg for only 24 hours, but his words have been permanently etched into history. Edward Everett, the lead speaker, later told the president, permit me also to express my great admiration of the thoughts expressed by you with such eloquent simplicity and appropriateness at the consecration of the cemetery. I should be glad if I could flatter myself that I came as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. Less than two years later, President Lincoln was assassinated. In his eulogy for the president, Senator Charles Sumner said of the Gettysburg Address, the world noted at once what he said and will never cease to remember it. The battle itself was less important than the speech. On that clear November day, Lincoln came out before the vast assembly and stepped slowly to the front of the platform. With his hands clasped before him, his natural sadness of expression deepened, his head bowed forward, and his eyes cast to the ground, said Union Army officer E.W. Andrews. The great assembly listened almost awestruck as to a voice from the divine oracle. There, before a crowd of approximately 15,000 people, on November 19, 1863, Abraham Lincoln said, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who gave their lives that the nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which 
they here gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Eighteen sixty three was uh, the most momentous year for Abraham Lincoln's presidency. Uh, you could say it was one of the most momentous years for the nation, the United States. Uh, and it wasn't just the, the battle at Gettysburg, the, the turning point in the Civil War. Earlier in that same year, uh, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, ordering all the slaves to be set free. This is what he said in that proclamation. He said, and upon this act, uh, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. That's from January 1st, 1863. And a few months after that, with the nation still teetering on the brink, Lincoln uh, appointed a national day of fasting for the nation, for Americans to draw closer to God, to recognize the supreme authority of God Almighty. This is what he said in that proclamation. He says, it is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. He said, we have been the recipients of the choicest blessings of heaven. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation ever has grown. But we have forgotten God. We've forgotten God. He said that in 1863. And he was pleading with the nation to drop to its knees and to cry out to God for deliverance because he knew that only God could rescue the nation. And do you know that God actually did hear that prayer? And he did intervene? And he did rescue the United States? Just two months after that call for a nationwide fast, the tide of war turned against the Confederacy right there at Gettysburg. And the North finally did gain the upper hand. I mean, not without a lot of bloodshed and violence in the process. Well, that was the bloodiest war in, uh, in the modern era, up to that time, it was the bloodiest war on earth. What happened there at Gettysburg? And finally the North had the, the rebels on the run. I want to show you a short clip from the Key of David. This is a, a program that my father recorded on location at Gettysburg in 1999. And in this particular clip, he's explaining how Lincoln, uh, one man, brought the nation to its knees, literally, in prayer and in fasting. So we'll take a short, uh, short glimpse of this particular clip. As I said, it's from 1999 on location. But he, in one sense, brought the nation to their knees shortly, be, just a few months before this battle here at Gettysburg, after the North had lost victories in Chancellorsville and Fredericksburg. Abraham Lincoln went into his room and locked the door, got out on his knees, and prayed to God for victory at Gettysburg. It was already beginning to build, and he knew there was going to be a battle there. Prayed to God, according to Wayne Whipple, one of his biographers, that God would give him victory, and he made a, he made a vow to God and said, if you give us victory, I will stand by you, and I will take a stand for you every opportunity I have. And I think Abraham Lincoln did. Now, it is interesting that the tide of war changed here in Gettysburg. Who changed that? Did prayer to God change that? If we were to bring our nation to its knees today, if we had a president or a Congress that had the courage to do that, what a difference it would make in our land. And what a difference it made during the Civil War, even though we might tend to deny that. Look at the fruits. Going back to Lincoln's address on uh, November 19th, 
1863 at Gettysburg, he said, We here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, he said, shall have a new birth of freedom. This nation, under God, those two words really are the, the two most important words in that short speech, 270 words or so. But these two, under God, are the most significant. Lincoln knew from, from cruel experience that the nation absolutely could not survive unless it was newly born under God, as he said there at the end of the address. Now look at the United States today and look at the monumental challenges that this nation is facing, the dwindling influence that you see around the world, America pulling out or backing away or disappearing from regions, its influence and power. Look at the economic turmoil that we're in, the crushing deficits, all the debt that we've accumulated, and then look at the world at large, the international instability, all of these shifting alliances, nations ganging up on the United States. And meanwhile, right here at home, I mean, we've drifted so far from God. When you compare today to 1863, I mean, and even in that year, 1863, Lincoln was sounding the alarm. Let's look at a, a few verses in Deuteronomy 8. This is God's warning to Israel anciently through Moses, his servant, his prophet. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 11, it says, Beware that you forget not the Lord your God in not keeping the commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command you this day, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built goodly houses, it says, and dwelt therein, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. That's what God was warning the Israelites anciently. And that's what Lincoln warned the United States in 1863. We've had all of these blessings from God, he said. They came from God. And we've forgotten God. We've forgotten our Creator. Now you jump forward to the United States of today, and as I covered on yesterday's program, not only have we forgotten this, this God who created us, but you have many people in, in lead positions in the United States who are actively attacking the foundational principles on which the United States was established. Instead of, of enforcing the Constitution, many are trying to tear it down. And that spirit of lawlessness, it really does permeate all of American society, not just the highest levels of government. It's everywhere, this spirit of rebellion and lawlessness, as I discussed with you yesterday. I want to take you back to another speech. It's not quite as famous, um, one that Lincoln gave in 1838. This was when he was just a young man, 28 years of age. It, it would be hard to imagine a 28-year-old today giving a, a message such as this with so much depth and with a strong warning for his people. The title of the speech is The Perpetuation of Our Political Institutions. He was concerned even as a young man about this American experiment continuing. How could we perpetuate this? How could it continue? He was a young man and here he was boldly telling this fledgling nation how to survive how to survive. He began his speech, it's also known as the, the Lyceum Address, by expressing again the praise and the, the thanksgiving that he often did to the Creator God for all the abundance and the blessings that he had bestowed upon this land. And then he said, we find ourselves in the peaceful possession of the fairest portion of the earth as regards extent of, of territory, fertility of soil, and salubrity of climate. See, he was reminding Americans here that, that we all owed this debt of gratitude to our Creator and also to our ancestors, our founding fathers, the, the patriots of 76, as he called them in that speech, trying to get America to look back at its history. And at the same time, in that same speech, warning America of the very real danger 
that was facing us, the fact that there was so much lawlessness, the way he saw it in 1838, there were a few incidents of mob violence at the time, and it was just appalling to him that these mobsters weren't being punished, locked away. He said in that speech, the law is the law. And he explained how that while there might be some bad laws, then every, every step that can be taken should be taken to try to repeal it. But it had to be done through lawful means. It couldn't just be uh, done through a, a tyranny or by lawless behavior. There are guidelines set forth in the Constitution, he said, that can eliminate bad laws if you use the law the way that it was intended to be used. But he pointed out in that speech that even if it was a bad law, if it was a law, it had to be obeyed. Otherwise, you'd tear away the very fabric of society. If it was a law, the government was responsible for enforcing it, and the citizens, and leaders for that matter, were duty-bound to obey the law of the land, pure and simple. Going back to that speech, again, this is 1838, he said, let every man remember that to violate the law is to trample on the blood of his father and to tear the character of his own and his children's liberty. Destroys the nation, in other words. He said, let reverence for the laws be breathed by every American mother to the lipsing babe that prattles on her lap. Let it be taught in schools. Reverence for laws, he says. In schools, in seminaries, and in colleges, let it be written in primers, spelling books, and in almanacs. Let it be preached from the pulpit, proclaimed in legislative halls, and enforced in courts of justice. And in short, let it become the political religion of the nation. And let the old and the young, the rich and the poor, the grave and the gay, and all sexes and tongues and colors and conditions sacrifice unceasingly upon its altars. He was urging Americans to, to look to and to follow the example of the founders who had, had pledged their lives, their, their fortunes, their sacred honor to sacrifice for this new nation. And the only way it was going to survive was by having this reverential respect for the rule of law. That's what the young Lincoln was saying when he was in his 20s just a, a young man, he said a nation at war against the rule of law cannot stand. That's quite a warning coming from a man who would become one of the great presidents in American history. He warned, if destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. In other words, if, if this experiment ended in ruin, we only have our, ourselves to blame. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time, he said, or die by suicide. To America's founding fathers, character meant everything to the success of the nation and its leadership. The Constitution was based upon the fundamental principles of religion and morality. These were the primary building blocks of the American nation. George Washington said, The foundations of our national policy will be laid in the pure and immutable principles of private morality. Character was no minor issue to America's first president. He regarded it as the basis of national policy. Where did the Founding Fathers develop these ideas? Many of these principles stemmed from the Holy Scriptures. The Bible provided early Americans with the instruction and guidance of how to properly govern one's life. These beliefs helped build a nation of strong families and upright leaders. Today, America has dismissed the Bible as the foundation of developing righteous character. Men now leave it to themselves to determine right from wrong. Where has the rejection of biblically based principles led this nation? There is a cause for these effects. To understand the course of events that have led this nation to its current state, visit thetrumpet.com and click on the literature tab to request our free booklet, Character in Crisis.
like uh, Abraham Lincoln, Barack Obama rose to national prominence uh, in Illinois' politics. President Obama, if you look back at his presidential run or his campaign back in 2008, he uh, started his campaign in Springfield, which uh, of course has very strong ties to uh, President Lincoln. He really, uh, President Obama that is, he built his entire inauguration in 2009 around a, a, a Lincoln theme, Abraham Lincoln. And many uh, journalists and authors have referred to uh, Lincoln when, uh, when discussing the, the individuals of history that uh, Barack Obama admired. He took his oath of office in 2009 on the Lincoln Bible. And uh, as I say, the theme really was built around uh, America's president from the 1860s. Let me just quote to you from an article that uh, was printed recently in uh, Real, Real Clear uh, Politics. It says, one person who will, it's talking about the ceremony that they're having uh, today in, uh, in Gettysburg, the 150 year anniversary. It says, one person who will uh, not be among those honoring Lincoln is President Barack Obama. The White House gave no reason why the president would not attend according to the National Park Service. I mean, because of these ties and because of the fact that he's America's first black president, it was just generally assumed over the last year that he would, that he would attend the ceremonies. Uh, and it goes on to talk about some of that uh, history with uh, President Obama from 2008 that I just mentioned. The article says, in 2008, Barack Obama rolled out his presidential campaign in Springfield, Illinois, where Lincoln announced his own presidential candidacy. It says, throughout that year's campaign, Obama's staff embraced similarities between the two men as part of his persona. He allowed them to uh, encourage lofty comparisons, and after he won the election, he recreated Lincoln's 1861 train trip to Washington as part of his own inaugural spectacle. He took the oath of office on Lincoln's Bible twice. Lincoln brought the country to a revival at an unlikely time with his address. He gave a new meaning to the definition of sacrifice and service to the country for the purpose of the preserving the country. It says, Lincoln was asked to speak here only as an afterthought. The request for Obama to speak here has been sought for more than a year. <laughs> Lincoln just came at the last minute and made a few appropriate remarks. We don't know. And for a year now, uh, people there in Gettysburg have been urging President Obama to come. Uh, it says in this article, finally, his dismissal of the request shows a man so detached from the duty of history, from the men who served in the White House before him, that it is unspeakable in its audacity. Ask almost any person in this historic town even his most ardent supporters here are stunned. Even his supporters were stunned by this. Now, this hasn't gained a lot of national attention, this snub, as that article calls it. Uh, but in Pennsylvania, they're pretty much upset and angered by this snub. Now, there's a report, or there was back in, uh, well, last year, 2012, in the Huffington Post. I guess we don't have to read it, but basically it was saying how that whether you're on the right or the left, we should all unify around this uh, anniversary coming up. And in that article, it talked about how the president would be there. So a year ago, or a year and a half ago, he was coming, but for whatever reason, he decided not to attend when the official announcement was made uh, in October. A month ago, this is from the Wall Street Journal, it says there's, there's no inclination in this quarter to second guess the White House's rationale for not attending, and maybe it's just as well we won't hear Mr. Obama's thoughts on the Gettysburg Address. Uh, those words were about a renewal of the nation's unity, and five years into the Obama, speaking of the words of Lincoln, that is, the words of that, that address were about uh, a renewal of the nation's unity, and five years into the Obama presidency, the United States is about as politically divided as it can get. The division is so intense that Americans paint their political beliefs in one of two colors, blue, it says, or red. Now, I mentioned uh, just how strong the reaction has been there locally around Gettysburg and in Pennsylvania. This is from Newsmax, which just kind of collected some of the local reporting 
on uh, the snub, and it says, uh, newspapers in the Keystone State, which Obama carried in both the 2008 and 2012 elections, are taking the president to task for his decision. It says, for a, a president who has so demonstrably associated himself with Lincoln, the heir of Lincoln's policies, who announced his candidacy from the steps of the old state capitol in Springfield and used the Lincoln Bible twice at his inauguration, this is nothing less than a profile in cowardice. That's what someone wrote for the Patriot News in Harrisburg. Newsmax uh, quotes the Daily Record. How could he not pay his, his respects to those whose ultimate sacrifices that made his presidency possible? This uh, editorial asks, how could he not visit and acknowledge the new birth of freedom that is his and our nation's inheritance of that battle? It goes on and says, uh, quoting from the, the Daily Record, symbolism matters. President Obama could have used this occasion to offer words of healing and reconciliation as his Illinois uh, forefather once did. Instead, he is sending us a little known cabinet member to do the job of a president, of a statesman, of an orator. It's unacceptable, that particular column writes. And so whatever the reason, and we can't pretend to know why he chose not to go, but I think it's safe to say he passed up a golden opportunity to fulfill one of the promises that his campaign was out there making in 2008, and that was to bring the nation together and as one of those articles I just read to you pointed out, uh, we're hardly united. We're as divided as ever. But this is something that, that you know, for us here uh, comes as no surprise. We were telling you in 2008 that it wasn't going to heal this wound between the races, but that actually we were going to see more division between the races. This is from an article that my father wrote back in 2008. You can find this at the, the trumpet.com. He said, Mr. Obama says he's going to bring the races together, but we are seeing actions that will do just the opposite. He talked about some of the troubling associations uh, between Senator Obama at the time and some of his friends and such. He, he writes, my father says, the race card is going to be played often for political gain, and it's going to cost America dearly. This is not a small problem. We must understand where the race issue is leading us. The end result is going to be worse than anything you imagine. He encourages you to write for uh, the Ezekiel booklet that we produce, free of charge. And then he concludes saying, most people are fearful of even facing the race issue, but we must because, as Jesus Christ said, only the truth can set us free. And that is something that America has to do today, just as it did back in 1863. And at other points in our history, we have to face the truth. Go back and look at that article from 2008. Uh, by my father at thetrumpet.com. We also uh, plugged this in a promo earlier on the program, Character in Crisis, which talks a lot about not just Lincoln, but many of the founders and what they thought about America's founding and how essential the rule of law and religion and morality and these, these things were to the survival of the nation. So make sure you go to thetrumpet.com also and request your free copy of Character in Crisis. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you again next time.